perhaps it's a different instrument that was used to uh, measure some points versus another instrument in other areas. How do you represent all of that? What if some of them were derived from certain data types or if some of them we know some inherent errors in them? For example, when we find a lone point that's red, is it truly a red point or is it part of the error? How do we represent that on a spatial map? And uh, so these are the uh, causes of data uh, uncertainty in spatial, uh, spatial maps. And uh, I won't go through them. I've talked about some of them. We've talked of data sparsity, data type, the errors due to sampling. There's a data quality. There's all the way up to age. And even when we take multiple measurements, sometimes they don't agree with each other. And uh, so we have incongruence in the data. The question again is how do we represent this in a spatial map in an intuitive manner? So, introducing the variable grid method, uh, which uh, was developed, has been developed by the National Energy Technology Lab, which is uh, part of the Department of Energy in the United States. And it's very user driven. You decide what you want to see out of it, right? And uh, I'll go very quickly through it, but I'll also give you a prescription for looking at it. So, that's a traditional quad tree. And what you do, you can see a little set of data in that box on the left. And what you do is you look and first test for your first basic condition. Do I have, say, in this case, one point? If there is, then you split that grid into four, right? Into four, into quadrants. And then you go to each quadrant and you test for your next condition. Do I have maybe two points? And if you do, then you split that again in four. And you keep doing that until you end up with a spatial uh, grid uh, like that, right? Uh, but it has flaws in it. You can see grids two and three do not have any data in them. But the thing is that there was at least one point in that quadrant, so you split it in four. And this is why we have the variable grid method that addresses that issue by going bottom up. So what we do is we start by splitting the whole area into the finest grid pattern possible. And when we do that, then we test for the highest condition. We say, for example, do we have four points or do we have these data, uh, data types? And if you satisfy, then you maintain the grid. You do not maintain that grid size unless it meets that high criteria. Then you go to the next lower criteria. And if it is, is, it's not there, then again, you open up the grid and you keep doing that, either maintaining the grid or opening it up until you complete your criteria, right? Now, that is a pattern you'd end up with, and you can see in this example uh, for the variable grid method, grid number two is not split because it has not satisfied the criteria of having at least one point. And so in this case, and this is a prescription I'm giving, you can use pixelation as the analog to looking at the variable grid method. Where you have small grids, it means that you have more confidence, you have less uncertainty. And where you have less, uh, bigger grids, then it means that you have less confidence or higher uncertainty. Okay? It's a way to look at it, pixelation, and we're very familiar with pixelation. So let's see how we've applied it in Block 14T. That's uh, for geographical reference, a map of Kenya. You can see Block 14T outlined by the pink uh, border. And then there's that glob of points uh, bordering the Tanzanian border that is uh, expanded there on the right that shows all the different measurements we've taken in Block 14T. Different colors represent different types of measurements. So let's do a first example, which is the most basic example we can look at, which is to evaluate how we have progressively reduced uncertainty in the block and only looking initially at data sparsity. This is the base, most basic use of the variable grid method. So we look and say, OK, let's first split the entire area into half kilometer by half kilometer grids. If we satisfy the condition of four measurements in that half by half kilometer, we maintain the grid. If not, we open it up to a one by one kilometer grid. And we now test, do we have at least three measurements in there? If there are, we keep the grid. If not, we open up to a two by two. I think you get the point. So let's walk through our journey of data acquisition in Block 14T. In 2010, we took several measurements of gravity, and you can see there we have some one by one kilometer grids. They are the small little boxes. Okay? We have some two by two, which is the next size, and we have some four kilometer by four kilometer. But we do not have any half by half, which tells us there is no 
there's no area, there's no grid uh, where you can find four measurements in a half by half kilometer area. We continue, we took some magnetotelorics in 2014, and you see we have some more of the one of the uh, two by two, and maybe a few more of the one by one, but still no half by half. We then did some magnetics in 2019, and now you can see in the northern area, we have more of the one by one kilometer grids, and more of the two by two kilometer, maybe one or two more of the four by four, but we still do not have any half by half kilometer grids. So let's fast forward, and look at all the other measurements we made after that. We took magnetotelorics in 2021, 23, and gravity in 23, magnetics 23, and now you can see a whole density of the half by half kilometer grids in a certain area which tells you that that is where the focus is and that's where we are looking more closely at prospectivity. Now this is the most basic use of the method. We can start to go a little more complicated. Unfortunately, we only have time for the two examples. We can say, now we want to really know what type of data do we have in the grids? Not just that we have a measurement, but there are certain combinations we need to see to be able to de-risk the block because we can create a much better picture or a much better image of the subsurface. So we are going to add another criteria now. We're going to say, we're first going to look and make sure we have some data. Okay, in the top uh, line uh, under data density, we want to make sure we have at least three measurements. And we want to make sure that it is both magnetotelorics and gravity or magnetotelorics and magnetics. If we satisfy that condition, we create a half by half kilometer grid. If not, we go to the next and we look for at least having magnetotelorics. By the way, the reason we are taking a lot of magnetotelorics is that we have volca volcanic layer that makes seismic imaging very difficult. So magnetotelorics, and you'll be hearing about that more in uh, one of our presentations coming up, is really key to imaging of the subsurface here. That's a pattern you get when you look at magnetotelorics and magnetics, and you can see that we have quite a fine density of half by half kilometer grids, which starts to tell you where we are focused. And then also magnetotelorics and gravity, you can see the pattern that we showed in the previous map that shows you where we have that high density. And in fact, looking at this, if I could point, you can see where we are actually working right now, which is to fill up that little area where we don't have a, a cluster of the half by half kilometer grids. Now, one last thing before I conclude, which is to say that one very powerful uh, use of this method is be, uh, the ability to view both the uncertainty and the data simultaneously. Okay? It's very intuitive because you could say, for example, well, just plot the points. I can see where the points are. Well, but by the time you start getting clusters of points in half by half kilometer grids, you cannot zoom back and see anything. Okay? You have to essentially, this is why the grid patterns make it very effective to be able to see what the data looks like. So there's our half by half kilometer grids on the, on the gravity pattern, and we can fold in or overlay it onto the evolving mapping of that area using gravity. And you can see that there is some structure, there's some area of interest where we are looking more closely at prospectivity. And you would tell me, yes, close up that area and let's make sure that we understand it in more detail. Okay, that's the first option. You could also uh, take the values that you have in each grid and average them and create a, a pixelated map of the data that you're looking at. Okay? So those are the two ways that you can use the method. So in conclusion, uh, this tool is very effective because it is highly intuitive. You can look at it and see very clearly the progressive de-risking of block 14T in an objective manner. Okay, without just looking at points spread all over the place, and you don't know whether they are gravity, magnetics, magnetotelorics, or whatever they are, right? So it's very effective for communication of spatial data and trends to even non-technical people. This is an, a tool you can use to ma for management to justify, for example, if we are showing a map like we did, we can see very clearly what is remaining to be done to be able to complete the mapping of the area. The next step really is to see how we can use it as a planning tool. And uh, that includes, for example, could we go to blocks that we may be interested in and actually look at the data using the variable grid method and see exactly where data has been taken, to what density. And like I said, it's user driven. You decide what type of data combinations you want to see and thereby you can create your own uncertainty mapping. 
Okay? We can also use it to optimize data acquisition uh, campaigns, either for planning or costing uh, of their campaigns, and being able to have decisions made even by non-technical management. And finally, also among other uses, is the opportunity to use it to have an objective approach to saying why you would want to surrender. We know most production sharing contracts have a surrender clause. How do you know which area to surrender and how can you demonstrate that and make a strong case to management, right? Then it makes it a very simple tool to be able to communicate that information. There's some more information about the, the, uh, this uh, method and on that website, you can also download your own free version, at least for the time being, and be able to try it out. And obviously, your feedback would be most welcome. Thank you. That's all I have for now, and I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, the audience. Uh, if we have any questions uh, about for Paul to uh, respond to quickly, so that uh, we try to move it forward. Any question on the method from the audience? Uh, was the mic, the mic? Yeah, this. Thank you, uh, the presenter, as well as the moderator. Uh, I'm Shaidu uh, from TPDC, Tanzania. So I'm very much interested with the, uh, the method that you have showed us. So one question that I have is, what exactly does uh, dictate or control uh, the selection of the points? I mean, it's like you have shown us the anomaly of the gravity data. Uh, and so I'm eager to know, is it like the anomaly that is directing you where to, uh, you say that you have a data point, or is just where you have the data regardless of the uh, the value of the data? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, I think one of the most important things to note about this method is that it's user-driven. You decide what you want to evaluate in terms of uncertainty. Say, for example, certain data types are very important for you. You can create those as your criteria to say, I must have not just data, but these data types and this combination of data types, because those are the ones you are going to use in your integration of data and in your inversion, okay? So you decide. Now, maybe it doesn't matter to you, maybe all you're taking is one measurement type. Then perhaps we go back to the very basic use, which is simply data sparsity, right? That's all you're going to be looking at, that I have points everywhere. But the more powerful use is where you combine different types of data. For example, you could look and see how many intersecting size and clients do I have? But not only seismic lines, do I have a well, right? Not only a well, do I have these types of data? And you can create your own menu that then drives the grid sizes based on what you want to see, okay? And now you can communicate that and say, my smallest grids mean that in there, I have A, B, C, and D, which is very important for me, and I have it in at least this quantity. Right? And that's why I said also as a planning tool, you could effectively simulate the types of data densities you want to see. And after that, then you can come back and now cost or evaluate the time or evaluate some other aspect of what you want to do in terms of your data acquisition. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, let's give a round of applause to Paul. Thank you, Paul. So uh, the next presenter is uh, uh, Gugoji John Kudai. Uh, please, the podium is yours. Good afternoon.
Okay, my name is Migonj John Kidai, and I'm from the University of Dar es Salaam. And I'm here to present uh, in a research which we did on the application of machine learning as a soft sensor for predicting gas weather depression. And we used the case study of Songo Songo gas field, which is operated by Pan Africa. So our major our major concern when we uh, when we were starting conducting our research is that we wanted to apply machine learning in our production facilities so that we can use them as soft sensors so that in case there's any malfunction in a sensor in a physical sensor we can still produce or can still continue our operations without having any downtown downtime or shutdown of the plant so our research we we selected weather pressure because it is among the most important data which we record in our production facilities. And then again, we went for Songo Songo gas field data because that was easily accessible by us. So we used production data for 10 years from 2004 and 2014 due to restrictions and bureaucracy in obtaining this data. So for specific our research, we con our main objective we did was to develop the soft sensor based on machine learning algorithms so that we can help reduce our downtime in our systems, which can be caused by sensor malfunction. So the main questions that arise in here were two questions. And the first question was, which machine learning algorithm can be used to perform you know, can, can be used to create our soft sensor. So we went through literature and obtained that extra trees algorithm was the best and the LSTM, long short term memory, can be used. And our second question which came to arise was, does the soft sensor comply with the measurement standards of the industry? So then we proceed to the methodology which we adopted was we started with collecting data. As we know, obtaining data from our production facilities there's a lot of bureaucracy. It's very difficult to obtain them. So we used the data for 10-year data, which has already been used for another purpose. This data was used for production optimization from 2004 to 2014. was the one which we were able to access it. And after collecting the data, we had to prepare the data. Our data from our production facilities has a lot of outliers, or has a lot of noise. So it required a lot of heavy cleaning. So we used also imputation by KN algorithm to fill out the data. And also we removed all the outliers from our data using two sigma. And also we performed the feature engineering so that we can correctly predict our weather depression from the inputs. And then we proceeded with training the models. So we selected extra trees algorithm and LSTM algorithm. And after training the models, we evaluated the models using the mean absolute error mean square error and the root mean square error. And we selected the base algorithm based on these criteria. And finally, we, we performed optimization for our model. So we conducted Bayesian optimization, which is the easiest optimization can be conducted. So we reached out our output very easy and it was very much correct, which we will later find out the results. Okay, the first result is that after obtaining the data, we had more than 20,000 rows, which had 11 parameters, including when pressure, we had production data, we had annular pressures for the field, we had also choke operation parameters, we had all the conditions surrounding the field, production field, Songo Songo field. And then after performing cleaning and normalization, we reduced the data from 20,000, then we remain with 17,000. So after that, we conducted the Pearson correlation, which always helps us to find the, which kind of pair of data are highly collinear that cannot contribute to our prediction results. So we also removed those data. And then after that, we trained the models and we found out that the error square for the extra tree algorithm was much better than for LSTM. So after just a minor evaluation, then we found out maybe the LSTM, LSTM algorithm did underfit because it required a, a lot of data compared to the extra trees algorithm. Extra tree algorithm is based when you don't have a lot of data in your data set. And then after training the models, the evaluation criteria which are normally used are the root mean square error, mean square error, and the mean absolute error. 
So you can again find out that for extra tree algorithm, it was much smaller, about a half of the one of LSTM. So our final soft sensor, which was created, we used the extra tree algorithm in order to make predictions for the wavelength pressure. And then after conducting Bayesian optimization to the model created with extra tree algorithm, we optimized the hyperparameters so that we can reduce bias and variances of our model. And then finally, we went to see that if it's possible, we can integrate our model to our operation system. So we found out that the mean absolute percentage error is about 0 0.02, which is way below than the one which it is controlled by the applicable standard that is used for measurement in the pressure sensors in the particular field of Songo Songo. They use the, the standard that they use for measurements is ASTM B40.800, which states that the absolute error should be uh, for about 2%. So after that, what we concluded from our research is that the extra tree algorithm was much better for pre making prediction based on our data. But the LSTM did not perform better because it required a lot of data. Maybe when we conducted data based on hourly operation, when we have high resolution data, it would have performed better. And then the conclusion made from our second question is that our soft sensor that was finally created was applicable because it complied with the measurement standard, the ASTM B400. Okay, the potentiality also concluded that this, the soft sensor can be applicable when we have any sensor malfunction that can cost us downtime. You know, this most of our natural gas facilities, they operate based on production. When you not produce for a certain time, you have to pay. So you, you must always be sure that you meet the demands, the output demands daily. So you don't want your plan to go down. And then the implications that we came to, to, to look around that uh, required by the government, that the government should conduct the investment required for machine learning. In machine learning, we usually need, we need softwares, we need people. And also in data management, as we heard before from the previous session, that management is highly regulated in our industry, field of industry. So it will be much better if the government could maybe have some sort of very nice policies that are not very stringent, so that they can be, we can collaborate maybe in making these such sensors. We can accurately and correctly, we can have reliable access from, for, the, for the data, for the accurate data. And also, in collaboration, we can see that the government could also provide access to private companies so that we conduct or they can apply or implement this new technology such as machine learning, specifically for soft sensors. And also they can be reinforced or they can be further be transcended to such systems such as the one we, we had previous before, such as the one of digital twins, and also the government should heavily invest in training people, which can be existing staff, or the graduate from our education systems. And also the business opportunity that lies here in our soft sensors and machine learning. The first and the most best reason is the economic reason. With these sensors, it will be much more better. You can, it can help you reduce all the downtime based on costs. It can also help you to optimize your systems. So when you have these sensors, how they work, is that you have variable points that you pick your data. So these points, they learn from each other what are their individual relationship between them. And in case one of it fails, so the other can help you to predict what was the other data that has failed. And also, when we conducted our research, we found out that in our particular industries, the one which we have at, Song, at Songo Songo, it's a real-time operation center. So it is much easier to integrate the soft sensor in a system because it, it already has facilities such as computers. So the basic thing we need here is data to process it. And when we compile, when we compile our soft sensor, we can easily integrate it into a system, existing system. So it can work in, con it can be integrated in a SCADA system. So to show you, the real time which is displayed by the real sensor in the field, and the other one can display you 
the one which is predicted by a soft sensor. So it can be also easy to, to see when there's an error in the system. So you can easily plan any kind of predictive maintenance that can happen. Another thing is that I've talked about about previously is collaboration with the government. So business have an opportunity to work with the government to deliver such expertise, especially in this kind of industrial specific challenges. And also another one is can increase your industrial competitiveness. So when having these sensors is that you are going to have much more better efficiency in your field. So assume that you just have to cut off all your downtime related to soft sensor malfunction. And also, it has room for further improvement as we have seen from previous session. We can also create digital twins, but you require much more data and much more resources. So based on resources, we can just, for, for our particular research, based on our resources we had, so we just ended up on soft sensors that can predict, but it can also be transcendent. So that, from the business opportunities there, I conclude my presentation. So I welcome question. Thank you, John, for this. Uh, uh, any questions for John? We want to make it brief so that uh, we roll over quickly. We are running short of time. Any questions from the audience to John? Thank you, John. Uh, give a round of applause to John. So, uh, Philip, the next uh, stage of yours. This one is for back forth. Yeah, this is for forth, forward, for backward, back. and then this is for? It's for uh, pointer, you don't need to point. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. All right. So you go this side. Sorry? I know. Okay. So when you are pointing to this, you point the sensor there. Yeah, you point this right there. Good afternoon. My name is Sir Philip. I work with National Oil Corporation as a petroleum engineer. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to present at this conference. I would want to welcome you to kind of join into supporting this presentation. It's almost like let's actually see what we have here the presentation. We worked on this by a number of colleagues and uh, probably I would also want to appreciate them as well. So my topic of discussion is enhanced oil recovery and I would actually skim through it. It's a lot of content to help you in understanding what we were doing. Basically I'll be honing in on the pilot study and of course associated analog projects. So let's actually move a little bit uh, quickly. So by definition, it's broad and no point reading. But from that, I would want us to understand one thing. We are actually looking at crude quality and recovery technology differentials. And that is not just going to be done for aesthetic is going to be tied to what we call commerciality of the project or economic viability, which is basically defined by effective cost management and efficient production. So let's actually see in summary, these are actually the main phases of uh, crude recovery. We've got primary relying on initial reservoir energy, secondary, recovery, and of course, EOR, our topic of discussion. And broadly, if you take second tire, secondary recovery, to tertiary recovery, they fall under improved oil recovery. So, these are the areas we'll actually be covering, generally. We have got prospects, projects, and production. Recovery factor in the current portfolio. We are going to look at a case study involving 
what has been tried and tested in the general industry. I mean, mature hydrocarbon provinces. Right above two fields, Gawa in Saudi Arabia, Androgen in Norway, with large homogeneous reservoirs, light oil as well. And then we move on. We look at lower case, comprising complex geology, low permeability, and heavy oil fields. Example, we have got Al Nur Kanalam in Oman. Mid case, you can actually see there. Still in Oman, Fahud, and of course there is a number attached to it, like 34% recovery factor. So the simulation we did for the pilot study, EOR in Kenya, at our discovery fields called Lokecha, was not done entirely on its own. We went ahead and aged it towards associated analogs, including the proven hydrocarbon provinces I mentioned earlier, and including our Delta neighborhood here, Uganda. So the figures might not actually pick here very well, but we'll see them shortly in the next slide. So as you can actually see, the red one is a representation of the mature hydrocarbon provinces, covering all spectrum, especially from down below, where we have got heavy oil reservoirs, and up where we had got large homogeneous light reservoirs. So we have got all those cases, Uganda 1, 2, and Kenya 3. And of course, all of them are still somehow correlated with the mature hydrocarbon provinces. So the highlight of this is the reference curve. And of course, we have got Uganda 1, 2, and Kenya. Let's actually see the figures as we roll ahead. So field optimization, drilling, and infill peaks at a point when we've actually produced the field over time from primary energy. Then we get to the second one, EOR peaks. And of course, we've got aspirations of EOR as well. So actually, let's crank the numbers. This is actually some of uh, the results we got from aging it against what is really known in those mature hydrocarbon provinces. There's a magic number which we keep talking about in Uganda as, you know, what is recoverable. You see that 1.4 here again. You can see Uganda 2, highest case Uganda 1, lower case, and Kenya, extreme what? Extreme right. So if you look at first tire, which is primary reservoir production, we can actually see billion barrels recovered would be around 1.4. And that is actually equivalent to mean recovery factor of 22. If you go to Uganda 1, it's around 1.2. Also equivalent to mean recovery factor of what? 22%. Look at tier 2. We don't stop there. Because that is basically primary recovery. And you cannot actually invest so much and, you know, just produce a little and move on you need to kind of put in a lot of effort to take as much as possible. So tier two, it improves to 1.8 with a correlated recovery factor of 28. That is for Uganda two. And we go to tier three, where we've got primary, secondary, and tertiary production. It even improves to two what? Two billion. And corresponding recovery factor is 31 there. Then, I talked of your aspirations. So that is tier four. We have got primary, secondary, tertiary, and the aspirations. It even improves it further to 2.2 billion barrels. So from the magic number of 1.4 billion barrels, which is actually conservative insofar as what can be recovered in Uganda is concerned, you've got a wide array of spectrum and what to do to get to higher production. That actually gives you that is actually based on original oil in place of 6.5 for the high case Uganda. The lower case was actually based on 5.7. Kenya, which was our pilot study here, will be looked at in the same prospect, but we just having a small discovery over there. So ours was based on original oil in place of around 2.0. 
2.5 billion barrels. But Kenya, despite the fact that we discovered late after Uganda, we pretty much done good studies there. So we can actually see as well, our recovery improves as we keep on putting a lot of effort and you know, keep on investing in the project. So let's actually look at technology landscape, what we can actually do to help us with all that. We've got thermal recovery methods, we've got gas injection, and then of course we've got chemical flooding. Then again, what we're doing here is not an R&D purely. It's been tried, tested, and proven. So this is actually historical analogy of how these trends have actually been improved and they've actually been implemented over time. We can actually see the uptake of some methods depending on reservoir conditions and everything else, like CO2 injection being used, and that is reservoir uh, dependent as well. So the next is estimated worldwide ER produced oil. Using an answer recovery, there is a lot of data and records on how different areas have actually recorded massive improvement in production. So like if you take at this method of thermal EOR, we can actually see it's the highest. And you can see US is the highest producer there. Again, look at US across all methods they've been trying. So those are actually some of the methods we use. And basically, we use them to tweak what we call the chemistry of the oil. Basically, changing the phase behavior and also maintaining reservoir pressure to some extent so that we actually leave as little oil tied to the ground as possible. Kind of process to be applied. I thought of uh, putting this together so that it gives you an analogy, one dimensional analogy of what we're going to do to make sure we get the best. And of course, when I talk of one dimension, the results I'm going to showcase is actually 3D, going to bring all the methods together and we sensitize them against all the oil properties and choose the best. So for example, this one, you would actually look at a case for steam injection. It will cover as well for a broad array of oil viscosity, but it is depth limited. If you look at miscible flooding, well, it is limited in terms of the viscosity range it can cover, but depth-wise, it can take us a long way. So we are actually going to look at everything and choose the sweet spots, depending on the reservoir quality and everything else we look at. So the next one, these are the sensitivities we carried on our Kenyan oil field, based on the quality of the oil and, you know, the various proven methods we've ever known. So I'm going to go through them and see the overall representation, as you can actually see in a diagram, the summary of the results. So in this plot, you can actually see we've done sensitivities and kind of paired them from best to worst, depending on our case. We realize that miscible, uh, not miscible, polymer flooding, became number one. And as you can see over there, it has got the highest weight. Here again, is another representation of the same. So this is actually now the 3D representation of what we come up with out of this pilot study. As you can see, always red means danger. Green means you're safe to go. More green, even better. So again, polymer flooding, as you can actually see there, it became tops in our case. So that means it's good to go for that method. Environmental and economics aspect. Whatever you do must actually honor safety. Better safe than sorry. What you do must actually tie to safety, safety first. Again, we look at some of the best practice you need actually to do in the field. And this was actually taken from what's been tried, tested, and we need actually to also learn from the best. So we can actually see increasing complexity and cost down there and increasing recovery factor. So you've got to invest. Then recovery factor again down there. Then level of effort required. 
that too needs to be observed. So here, it tells you, you've got to build it over time. And you really need to make sure each and every phase is effectively dealt with, proven, qualified for you to move to the next stage. You won't get it wrong. I tell you, it's been done, tried, proven, so it's a matter of applying what has actually been qualified. Another one is over here. This just, you know, staircase of the time period we would actually require to get this to be effective. So as much as we are actually going to invest in resources, time is also a key resource in doing all this. So something which is also critical is the cost element. Because the next important thing, we are not doing this thing for aesthetic. What we want is success and success in business. But specifically in oil and gas, it boils down to what is known. Effective cost management and efficient production. That's it. So let's see how that works. This is what we saw there last time, the tiers of production and what you are actually going to kind of expect once you implement all the phases of production. This is actually the profitability slide where we've got a positive net present value based on applicable contract you have with whoever the operator is in that field. It's positive beyond zero, that is good to go. So these are the input data and of course input parameters. The other side, we look at indicators. So at the end of the day, if we realize it's actually a zero, we are good to go. Here we've got positive NPV. So that is even better for us. So once the investors see this sort of clear cut analogy, they'll be much more happy to invest in your project. So I'm almost taking you to another slot of further sensitivities. The NPV we looked at there. Aged again is very simple data. We see that this country is more sensitive. So if ever the loan interest and all that increases, then the project can be less viable. Things like signing bonus and all that also have got their effect, but not too much on the project, as you can actually see. This is another representation of the same on NPV, this spider diagram, and you can actually see the swings. As you can see, our number one was discount rate, and you can actually see it literally. It's got a lot of swing, depending on what happens as you implement the project. And that goes on all the way until we get to the signing bonus we saw on the previous one, which had got the least effect, which is also seen in this plot, spider plot. The next one is just a recap of that NPV representation. This is now the web what? The web NPV. So if you tie the three together, at least you'll actually resolve the gray areas, which normally would exist between a white and a black. It's not purely black or white. The grays are important and we need to eliminate them. So I think in summary, we've got, you know, planning successful ER projects. We know very well that confidence is half victory. If you plan, if you train well, then you'll definitely prepare for whatever challenge coming ahead of you. Otherwise, if you don't, still you're planning, but planning for a failure. So I tend to think some of these things really need to be taken with the result, which is pragmatic, tried, tested, and you move with that confidence and implement it. So I'll be very grateful to welcome any interaction in terms of Q and A. Okay, once more uh, from the audience, any questions to the presenter, Philip? Anybody with a kind interaction in terms of question? Okay, Philip, uh, let's give Philip a round of applause. So, so next is Herbert. Uh,
uh, but this gives up the body. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, uh, mine is, isn't a technology advancement topic. It's to do with data management. And I was involved in a project to just find out what causes an enterprise, an oil and gas enterprise to have uh, poor quality seismic and well data. Yeah, you, you, next. So basically, uh, it's, 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 it was a project to do with quality control of data. And we, we all know that seismic and well data is very important for an oil and gas enterprise because it's used to model the uh, subsurface uh, through different phases and you having poor quality data you will use it and get poor quality output which can cause you lots of issues for example you can model and say actually this is where i'm meant to drill and get my oil and since you've used poor quality data you end up going to the wrong position and you waste all that money if you have poor quality seismic and well data at the time of you selling off your assets you'll get issues and i've had an experience with this which which we shall talk about in front there so the cost of reacquisition just imagine you've gone and acquired seismic and then you didn't take precautions or you gave out money to a company to acquire seismic you didn't take qc and then in the end you have poor quality data or you've gotten money and actually bought data but since you didn't have a, a professional qc officer with you they give you data that you can't actually use and then if it's in an enterprise where people are already using it if say you can't find it because you didn't name it properly it turns out to be poor quality and that will be lost uh, product productivity or if you say if say you, you you have the data but then it's missing some attributes and you can't load it it also becomes a problem in the cases of you reporting the data to the authorities uh, if you report bad data you, you're penalized unless that's the that's the only way you could get it then uh, in terms of monitoring uh, if you're basing on data that's not okay to monitor, then most probably you 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 you'll be basing on wrong information, and the IOCs in the field can go bad against you. So the data you are talking about is data that is used in an enterprise, and an enterprise will have a life cycle. For example, data comes in when you receive it you 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 prepare to give it to people and after giving giving it to people they interpret it you make decisions and in case some of the data you don't want it you dispose it off and still that data people use it but they use technology uh, to interpret it and they follow certain processes so it there is some sort of interaction matrix between people process technology and data so if you're looking for any faults, uh, any causes of uh, poor quality data, then you have to look at those four aspects. Next. So uh, this is the methodology. It was an action sort of research. Uh, you, you, you were looking out for uh, what goes wrong and how can we improve it. And uh, at some point we did an interview. We did interview people. Then other points, we just looked into the data itself to find out where things go wrong. So uh, when we interviewed people, 
we came up with uh, four themes and then still the themes include our results gotten from observations and we found out that for example if data is being reported to you it has to be systemized it has to be reported in a system otherwise if it's just submitted so on a flash uh, then most probably you will be unable to track it in case it's time of its peak peak time so when you systemize it it means which whatever data comes in you catalog it and most enterprises will not have this and yet it's the best thing to have and then uh, if say they are re reporting flows for example you're meant to have one inlet but if you have one QC officer and you, you or let's say we are having a guard and he's seated here and then there are multiple doors coming in uh, in case we want security then that security is you it won't be efficient so this is the same thing if in an enterprise data comes in through different routes most probably you'll not be able to track each of those entries and as such you you may end up having poor quality data ca coming in and in case it may also be good quality data but since you haven't cataloged it then at some point you will not find it and data that you can't find is useless data uh in terms of complying with the standards we found out that uh in most cases people submit data uh, but because we don't have explicit laws that define uh, the dimensions in which that has to be submitted it turns out to be a problem for example you can have data in segway format seismic data but in its header you don't have coordinates in it so if you say you just say oh this is segway data we can use it in the end you will try to load it and it doesn't load and as such it will become useless data uh we also found out that they are subjective validation processes say you have five officers choosing data and you don't have a process any sop to follow everyone will do their own qc and in the end you'll have data but you don't you can't define the standard on which this data is and in the end you end up having data that doesn't have uh, a, a known standard so we also found out that uh, there are no punitive measures in most countries so if say the issue is submission late submission of data because say you let yourself you you submit data in late then you will cause confusion if somebody was meant to choose it on a certain date in a certain month then you and there is some other workload coming in you cause a backlog which contributes to difficulties in QC. Another one was need for quality flags. If you have issues in a company and then the data isn't okay, whenever you see that this data is lacking some attributes, you have to register it somewhere. But throughout the companies I worked for, I uh, haven't encountered a, a data register. You may have a catalog of whatever you have, but you don't have a register of the issues that each of those data has because when you know the issue then you can operate with it properly choose limits who is meant to choose C data up to what point and then need for collaboration for you to collaborate for you okay for you to choose C data properly you need to collaborate with the experts in case you end somewhere then you tell them yeah this is what we have you can do more detailed QC and then later you approve it now another major issue was project data management people use data and then the people interpret data come up with results you need to store those results if you don't store them uh, you will make a decision basing on that data and then a user won't keep won't keep the project like you would keep it later they can later the user will come back to you and is asking for the data that they used but never submitted to you as a data manager so this is important and then um, they need to create master projects where people can just do referencing of the data other than uh, them loading the data by themselves. And that way, uh, it's a way of removing duplications. 
So the last thing was to do with technology. For they, we found out that uh, for you to manage data properly, you need to have a database, which database has its own catalog. And then uh, when you have both of those, you, you can easily track whatever you have. But if the database isn't stable, I uh, say it changes every day. It's, it, it's not usable, it's not searchable. You can't search what you put in. However much you do things like integration, but when you can't easily search, say I just type in a name and get out things, then you end up in big chaos. So in conclusion, next, yeah, next. Uh, I don't know what's happening. Okay. Uh, as a way forward, we, we had some suggestions and we said we, for, for data quality management to be a success, you have to have some sort of framework where you have the people uh, harnessing technology to do the QC of the data and then you have to follow uh, stipulated processes which you agree on as data managers and as users because the agreement has to be in, it's, it has to be enterprise wide otherwise what you agree on as a data manager may not be important to the users and yet the data is about the users using it successfully to make right decisions so these are some of the things that we've been talking about and for you to manage data properly first of all you have to know what do i need uh what are the what what are the requirements that the users need and upon you knowing what the users need what is critical for the business uh then you can analyze the environment where is the data passing you, you, you have to write up a data pipeline, how the data is going to move within the enterprise. And then as, when you know where the data moves, you assess the quality at different points. Say if data is being mismanaged at the point of entry, you work out a plan to uh, streamline that. If it's being managed at the point of user, you saving uh, user generated data, you work upon that. So it's basically you looking out for the different points when you have a pipeline, then you know, they were talking about uh, leak detections, you know where things can go bad and then you work upon that. Then if, if there is any issue, you correct the issue. Basically, how you arrange this depends on the architecture of your enterprise. And when you have your corrective measures, when you have audits within what you within audits against your data, against the standards you've set, then you manage to uh, uh, curb some of those issues that we saw up there. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's a mic. Uh, let's make it quick. You already tried. Yeah, thank you, Herbert. Interesting study there. Um, I was just wondering, of all the different causes that you mentioned for mm. poor quality data, which one would rank highest? Uh, the one that would rank highest is, uh, let me give you two. One is multiple entry of data. You should have a single point of entry. And then two, it's uh, a culture issue. For example, if data comes in at those different entries, there should be a responsible officer to report it. Say if, for the case of regulators, if say data was submitted to an area manager or submitted through a, a point that is not recorded on the data pipeline, then there should be a responsible officer to report it to data management so it's a culture issue there should be communication 
part of the, the, the actually one of the biggest problem is is data management not being in communication with uh, the entire enterprise. If you are in good terms and you're communicating, then most probably you curb those points of multiple, multiple entry. And in case anything comes through a route that is not known, then you'll have good relationship and it will be submitted to you and you catalog it. Because for you, you will know how to handle everything. But if it comes through a route that is, isn't known, then there will be issues. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we, are, we are already late. We're being pushed out of uh, the room for another group. We still have one more uh, presentation coming up. I think we should have five minutes just run through uh, and uh, wrap up for the next group. Please, uh, Dr. Godfrey. Thank you, the moderator. Uh, good evening. Uh, I don't know if I would make it in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so my talk is on uh, 3D magnetometrics uh, for Bayesian characterization. Uh, but we'll get a case study of uh, Magadi Bayesian. Uh, those are my co-contributors. Uh, my name is Godfred Oskuku. I am a geophysicist at National Oil Corporation of Kenya. Now, this is, this is the presentation outline. Uh, basically, this um, talk is about looking at uh, our previous geophysical campaigns and uh, the limitations that we had. And after those limitations, what do we do? Because we have to continue uh, looking for this resource that uh, is uh, somewhere in the subsurface. So there is a uh, a tool that uh, we would be basing on the talk about, that is uh, the MT uh, and the 3D model, uh, to be able to uh, help us uh, mitigate around the limitation that we had in their previous campaigns. Now, uh, we have done, as I mentioned, several uh, campaigns in that block, uh, starting with the uh, potential fields, that is an seismic ground gravity, uh, magnetics, FTG, uh, and as well as seismic studies, two, uh, seismic, uh, two D seismic surveys. But still we could not uh, get some info that we wanted, especially in the risking uh, the structures to get where do we uh, drill. So therefore, uh, this talk is important, and even as a close to our neighbors, maybe uh, the Tanzanians, because we, you have a block uh, to the northern part of your country that is just close to, to us there. Uh, even in, for Uganda, we share some uh, geolog geological uh, uh, context that uh, this method can be applied to. So in this uh, model or in this uh, uh, study, we use uh, three, 158 empty stations. Of course, where we have acquired an empty station, we also have acquired uh, uh, the, the TDM, what we call the time domain electromagnetic uh, uh, point for, for static correction. Um, of course, uh, we will not be able to showcase the whole basin. It's just to cut uh, a small part of the basin. As you know, this is a, a part is a derivative of confidential data. You know, so we used uh, a data sets that, uh, through, and then we inverted using the CGG GeoTools uh, 3D model that we've customized in our in our uh, corporation. The methodology is that, uh, of course, you have to go to the field and then acquire data. Uh, once you acquire data, as I've told you, uh, you're acquiring data. Where you're acquiring the empty data, you also acquire the TDM data. And then uh, you have the QC aspects uh, in, the, in the field. So we have the software that do that uh, for both uh, the TDM data and the empty. Uh, for now, I think uh, most resilient, we have the Empower, and we also have other, the CCM 2000, other softwares for QC. And for TDM, we have the 1XD. Uh, of course, they are formats of the data that you need to have. Uh, though, we also have softwares that work on this now, because after you QC that data, for example, the empty data has to be gotten in a, a EDI format, and then uh, the TDM data, you have to get it in whichever way, UCF, AVG, format like that. Uh, and then you process that data. Of course, you can get the 2D 
cross sections both in uh, for the softwares we have we have two softwares the wing link and uh, the geo tools that we've customized so the aspect that we want is really looking at the 3d model and uh, this we're using uh, as i mentioned the cgg geo tools to be able to build and invert and cloud and then have the results so the results are of course uh, you can see that those ground gravity you have ftg so there is an area of uh, interest the anomalies that you can be able to see so when you integrate where we have gotten the, the gravity data sets and then where we have the ftg there's a, a consistent anomaly that we can see so now but uh, after that we did the seismic and you could see uh, you can see what is happening in that seismic uh, if you look at that line for example where i have circled there you can see uh, and where do you have seen the, the pink or something, that, that color, uh, you really being able to know what is there, it's, it's, it became so difficult eh, to interpret. And so you have the, that limitation. Uh, I hope you could bring that down, the, the ICT guy. So there's that limitation, being able to see, is it as a result of volcanics? You can't see exactly where the, uh, the, the, the extent of the sediment, I mean the basement. Uh, so, therefore, another method to be able to delineate that sediment, uh, basement was very key. And you can see the same line now using the, the empty uh, 2D. Uh, you, you, you can be able to map uh, the, the extent of the basement very well. So, you, so now the aspect of, of geophysics is that uh, the idea of joint imaging, not relying particularly on one method, then comes into play for us to be able to move forward to the risk our structures. So you can see if uh, this is able to show you even up there, your recent sedimentation because it's a resistivity method. Now, even this, uh, now you can see, for example, the interpretation you can see around that boundary fault where you have that, unfortunately, this pointer doesn't work there, but you can see where the circle is. Uh, it's around the boundary fault. And uh, being able to image and see very well what's happening there is, is an issue again. But look at uh, what, uh, the, the empty dust is able to give you a clear picture that uh, what you think maybe now is now a conversation. It's about the resistivity, low resistivity there. Uh, so high conductivity aspects. So it is unlocking a lot of information around that boundary fault, the infills in that. Okay, so we find that uh, the empty is able to uh, delineate the basement very well and also is robust in resolving uh, uh, structures, especially where you have uh, volcanic uh, complexity. Now, in this, uh, when we had seismic, look at that seismic section. It was very difficult to see any structure. Uh, but look at uh, what uh, MT is able to do. So you can, uh, initially you think maybe there is nothing there. But because of the thick layer of basalts in that area, so it was, it could not allow the in seismic energy to be, to penetrate. So you could not be able to record any information. But look at uh, MT, he's able to delineate, he's able to see the volcanic layer, yes, up there. Then there is a structure beneath it that uh, you can clearly see. Uh, you, maybe you can play that. Now, aspects, 2D, 3, uh, 2D networks, cross-sections, but what about the 3D? Because we want to look at the basin and how it is. As you can see, uh, it starts from the bottom, then it, you are going up. So it starts like around a, uh, a depth of three, seven kilometer. It goes up like that. And because of time, I will just show you a, 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 some sli sli slices. Uh, but uh, with time, maybe we, it's a conversation that we can continue. Okay, so that is the surface. We start from the depth of the inversion that you have up to the surface. Okay, so let's move to, the, okay. Yes, so you can see those uh, depth slices. Uh, Yes. So you can see at that point, the basement uh, host shields in, uh, the, the, the initial basin from the volcano sediments. But as you move upwards, you can see sediments beginning to come, how the basin is beginning to open. And then look at uh, there, for example, uh, the reversal of the tectonics, you can see at that point. Then you could also see clearly like how Lake Magadi, for example, the current lake is forming. Yeah, you see, and then they connect you. So when you go now, you, the recent sediments you see are on top there. But uh, what was, is happening before, you can't see. So before even we drill, these are some of the methods that uh, we, methodology that we can apply to be able to 
image uh, the, the rift basins or uh, areas where we have the, the basaltic, uh, thick basaltic layers. Deep, uh, depth, three depth slice, 3D depth slices are able to give us a lot of information. You, as I mentioned to you, it depends on up to which level you are running the model. So, like you see, how the sediments that time, the segment that we just picked uh, from 4.5 kilometers, how it is coming. And even you can see that structure I mentioned to you that we were not able to see with this, the seismic, but it's now being seen. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, this is a tool that um, within the East African region we can be able to explore because of the complexity of our geological uh, 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 basins that we have. And then there's a lot of information that we get from this. The structures that were, are difficult to see with the other metals, we can see with this one. And, and we can also see the, the robustness of it to be able to see the connectivity of the structures on the evolution of these structures. So it's a, a good model to apply, and especially in joint imaging, so that we can be able to de-risk our structures and get where to drill. For interest of time, I will just stop there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Godfrey. In case of any question or anything, we will uh, follow up with uh, Godfrey on that. Uh, I think we just need to finish up uh, with the presenters getting uh, uh, a picture and uh, the souvenirs for the day, and then uh, we end the session. Please, uh, presenters, can line up up here. Okay, so uh, thank you the audience for uh, being patient with the presenters. I think uh, our session is ended. The, uh, the, next, uh, the next session that we were supposed to follow here is going to Victoria, Victoria Hall. The next session that we were supposed to follow this one is going to Victoria Hall. That is from uh, the information I, I'm getting from the manager. I, I think there is a mix up a bit. Uh, I have a different information from, of, from them. And I think we could, in the interest of time, we could continue from here. Thank you. We can continue now. Thank you. Let me take this opportunity to welcome our moderator of, the next, of this session. Thank you. Distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, or is it good evening? Uh, I have a very difficult task before me, uh, whereby I have to moderate a session that is supposed to take one hour in 20 minutes. That's one. Two, I'm not sure whether my presenters are around. So on that note, allow me to introduce myself since uh, no one is here to introduce me. My name is Clovis Brady Rumba, Director for Exploration 
uh, from the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Uh, we are here to discuss the endowment that God gave the East African region. Uh, you will all know that one of the most fundamental prerequisites for petroleum formation and occurrence is the existence of sedimentary basins. And it is the basis on that uh, where the theme is East Africa as a hub for investment in exploration and exploitation of petroleum resources for sustainable energy and socioeconomic development. We proclaim this theme for the simple reason that we are endowed with sedimentary basins without which we would not be here at all. Now, allow me to uh, go a step further and propose a way forward for us to be very effective. Uh, number one, once I have established that the speakers are around, they will take their seats without them being introduced. Uh, number two, they will give us the key takeaways from their presentations uh, without going into the details. But we should be able to thank them for the work they have done in putting together the presentations. Number three, we shall not ask questions in between until the end of all the presentations, but that is subject to me reserving my right to, to waive the questions. Thank you very much. Now, on that note, the presenters are the following. Uh, one is Mr. Musa Matthew Nalogwa, a geophysicist from the Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation. Uh, please come and take a seat in front. Uh, next is Mr. Innocent Kimoita, a geophysicist with the, the National Oil Corporation of Kenya. Uh, you are welcome, sir. Uh, next is Mr. Derek Mbenyi, Data Management Officer, Engineering from the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. He's coming, I'm reliably informed. And last but not least, Dr. Shaidunuru Shaban, Geologist, Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation. Uh, you will confirm that there is no mix-up in those uh, profiles because I noticed in the, in, in the conference booklet there was a mix-up and I struggled to work it out. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, without ladies. Uh, what we are going to do is, like uh, I highlighted earlier, we are really going to have takeaways from your presentations so that we finish very fast. I've been in your position before. It is painful to do a lot of work preparing a presentation that you are not allowed to make due to time limitations. It is always an occurring theme in these types of conferences. However, we do appreciate all the work you have done in putting together uh, whatever information you have put together for us. Uh, on that note, allow me to welcome Mr. Musa Matthew Nalogwa to come and tell us about 2D seismic design on frontier basins using potential field data, uh, highlighting a case study in the south of the eastern arm of the East African Rift System. Please join me in welcoming our brother, uh, Mr. Musa Matthew Nalogwa. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, as you have already introduced my name, okay, uh, I will be presenting uh, the 2D design seismic in a much uh, frontier area. Uh, okay, uh, as you said, it will be brief. Uh, we know the importance of, uh, of 2D seismic is uh, to get the uh, right information you're looking for. 
and uh, to obtain the comprehensive image it means you have to plan very well before uh, you start acquiring or spending money but that doesn't mean you have to uh, you have to trade uh, uh, equality with cost, then uh, it's where the question of optimization comes. So uh, this is the importance of uh, having having a, a design which is uh, well well thought before. Uh, this is the area, as you can see, uh, it's uh, in this uh, southern part of the East African Rift System. And as I introduced, the aim is to develop an uh, seismic acquisition plan. And this will use the application of the potential field and the magnetic and geologic information. So uh, this could be applicable to any other frontier basins. As you can see, the basin uh, is divided into uh, three sub-basins and is the area of approximately 10,107 kilometers square. OK. Uh, Basically, uh, we have uh, we have uh, like four or five layers uh, in terms of geology, which you have the basement, the scene rift, uh, which is Miocene. Uh, you have a Pleistocene post rift package, which is mo uh, mostly volcanic clastics, and the and on top you have sediment uh, sediment floods. Uh, in terms of methodology, uh, we started with geology, uh, geological and geophysical data which include uh, HEG and uh, uh, the gravity data. Then uh, there were interpretation on the structures of this data. We went through the literature review. We mapped the structures, the faults, the basin structures, and then we started the initial 2D seismic acquisition parameters. But on top of that, uh, we conducted the 3D modeling, uh, which we conducted the, f uh, initially we conducted the inverse modeling, then we conducted the forward modeling, uh, then uh, we conducted the misfit analysis, and then uh, at the end uh, we uh, uh, we introduced the parameter into uh, I mean we refined our parameters uh, for the 2D seismic, and then uh, uh, in 2D seismic we looked into the velocity analysis, which we used the Gardner equation to convert. Uh, offset limitations, migration, aperture, Fresnel's equation, aliasing, two-way time, and and then ham frequency profile was used to establish the uh, finer 2D seismic parameters. Therefore, uh, at the end, we had our final design uh, layout. So uh, this is the brief methodology, and then we used different software, which included our system attached, ArcGIS, and on 3D. Right. Uh, highlight of the result is uh, the velocity trend. Uh, we compared the velocity trend from three areas. Uh, we had the velocity trend from Lake Kivu, Lake Albertine, and the current uh, Lake Ayasi. Uh, the linear velocity analysis uh, conducted uh, indicated that uh, actually conforms very well with the velocity analysis conducted in the Eastern Africa, which used the real data, uh, but with a little difference on top. And uh, in the current study, you can see the velocity looked a little bit fast, but uh, generally uh, it conformed with uh, all other uh, basins within the Eastern African Rift. Uh, the targets were 2,000 meters and 6,000 meters. Uh, those were the proposed parameters uh, for the two, and this is the outline proposed, uh, the final layout for the acquisition in this block, as you can see in the map. Uh, therefore, uh, what we picked up, uh, the gravity data uh, helped to develop the design of about 1,074 line kilometers. And from the inversion results, it was concluded that the 2.4 uh, density option uh, was considered the best as it provided the maximum depth. Therefore, uh, the forward modeling refined uh, the basement surface uh, from the inversion and used to create the arbitrary depth, which accounted for the change in density with depth. The target frequency estimation uh, of dominant frequency 56 has uh, for the uh, 2,000 meter target, top target, and the deepest target of 6,000 meters. 
uh, with 22 hertz. Uh, we have the spatial sampling interval of 12.5 meters, which we concluded could be the best. And uh, actually, uh, this was sufficient to record uh, the frequency signal of up to 125 hertz and deep cell of approximately 40 degrees. Uh, the proposed seismic design also is uh, optimized by considering, as I said, both the cost and the quality implications for the desired parameters. Okay, uh, in terms of policy, uh, as this, since this is an exploration project, if it's successful, it play a clear role in increasing Tanzania's domestic oil and production because uh, the policy objectives is also to ensure the availability of reliable and affordable energy supply. Also, the policy aims to attract foreign investment in the energy sector. So if the basin is good, that means uh, it could attract more investors and eventually to provide the sustainability in energy. Uh, business opportunities uh, is there for the exploration production companies. Uh, these may engage in the current seismic activities or the, fo uh, the following drilling activities of the wells and also operating in oil and gas fields. Uh, there will be construction firms or engineering firms for the infrastructure because there will be needed uh, such services. Uh, service providers like logistic catering companies, uh, security and other type of companies will be required. You will also talk about technology providers uh, in terms of advanced technology introducing in the field as long as uh, it is needed at that particular time. Uh, this kind of activities, I mean, these kind of activities will provide uh, sort of opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Musa Matthew Nalogwa for, first of all, keeping time. You did it in uh, under seven minutes, but also for dispensing the wisdom arising from your analysis that you did. We look forward to reading your presentation when we have been given the conference proceedings. I have my brother here who is taking notes, so feel comfortable that we shall read uh, your materials. Now, talking about the uh, offshore, coastal, and inland basins in East Africa, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Uganda doesn't have offshore basins or inland basins we are, because we are not close to the ocean. Uh, we have inland basins, basically, and one of uh, the best we have so far is the Albertine Graben uh, in western Uganda. The Albertine Graben traverses the famous Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom. Uh, if you have read history, you must know something about the King Kabalega. So Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom is one of the most famous uh, kingdoms in the country, and it encompasses uh, regions uh, which we collectively call the Bunyoro region. Now, I have been advised that uh, our Minister of State for Bunyora Affairs is with us and join me in welcoming Honorable Namuyangu Kacha Jennifer. Thank you for choosing this session, Honorable Minister. Uh, now, without wasting time, let's proceed with Mr. Innocent Chimoita, who is going to tell us about depth estimation from Eula solutions and the composition of simple boga grids into regional and residual anomalies for geological structural mapping, case study of Block 14T, Kenya. You are most welcome, uh, Mr. Chimoita. Please take the stage and tell us what you have brought for us today. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Innocent Murunga Kimoita. Uh, briefly, I'll be talking about uh, depth estimation of uh, depot centers, and uh, I'll try to image uh, 
uh, some folds. I try to image uh, some dikes and some in intrusions and develop some residuals because they are very important in oil and gas. Essentially, as I've said, uh, the goal of my study is to estimate the depth of the depot centers, determine the presence and importance of the dikes and any other intrusions, and determine the presence and orientation of the faults within uh, my area of study. Uh, briefly, my area of study falls in the southern rift. Uh, on the western flank, we have Nguruman Escarpment. And then we have uh, the main fault called Koja Fault that appears on the eastern part of it. And then you can see Lake Magadi is there. And then further south, we have uh, Lake Natron. In this work, gravity data was collected at a line spacing of uh, three kilometers and certain spacing of uh, half a kilometer. We went further to develop symbol bogey, a normally grid shown there. Symbol bogey is, is very important because it's showing us some depot centers, three of them in fact, as I'm going to give them some names later. It also shows us some intrusions. Intrusions are very important in basins because they control the migration of uh, 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 sediments. I went further to develop uh, Euler solutions as a, a depth estimation algorithm. In that image, if you look at the uh, Euler solutions come as clusters or linear events. Where events are clustered together, it's a possible dike. And the way, when they're linearly di distributed, it could either be a fold or uh, an intrusion. For example, it could be a seal. In that image, blue colored, blue events are shallow, uh, uh, blue color uh, solutions coming from shallow events. However, the pink colors are uh, events that are deeply seated. So from my work, from my analysis, Euler Solutions works very well in identifying faults. The faults, those are faults that are parallel to the major fault, the Koja fault. There are kind of uh, three of them majorly. These faults must have been created by uh, from the process of rotation of the rocks. When a rock rotates, it creates, it, it creates space. It creates some accommodation space where sediments are able to accumulate. And uh, the solutions here, this is a kind of, a, is an intrusion that blocks, this intrusion is very essential in this, in this, in this study because it blocks the migration of sediments from uh, Lake Magadi towards uh, our depot centers on the depot centers are on the left. As an overlay of Eula, Eula solutions on simple bogey grid is very essential because Eula solutions is giving us information in terms of depth, but bogey is giving us the highs and lows. So I can name the three, if I, I name the three depot centers from the north one to be Musenke, or Kermatian and Pakase, the southernmost. The question is, which of these is deeply buried? Euler solution can try to answer that. Look at the Pakase, Pakase depot center, the, the one that has got yellow. It predominantly has got greenish to uh, bluish solutions. That essentially means it's shallowly seated. But if you can look at the Musenge depot center, it has got some ready solutions. The red solutions are to a depth of about three kilometers. So essentially that means uh, the Musenge, Musenge depot center is deeply buried compared to the three uh, depot centers. I also came out to that time with depth slices and uh, though not shown here, uh, the depth slices showed that uh, the 
Musenge Depot Center is deeply buried. In fact, Musenge and the Old Kremachan Depot Center are just one thing from the top. But as you go down to a distance of about three, kilo three kilometers, they separate. They stop being one thing. So essentially here, one, some, of the, uh, some of the Depot Centers are deeper than others. Uh, I had to bring in seismic information just to try to support the fact that uh, Euler solutions can also uh, it works well in identifying some faults. Yeah, the, the point is not working, but the two dots on, on the other side, intersection of this line with the, the, those lines, the first, the first yellow, the first yellow dot, it's a, it's a boundary fault, it's a major boundary fault which appears on line seven of seismic and is supported by the seismic that appears down there. And the second dot, it's line eight. And if you look at the seismic information, we also have a couple of uh, faults that appears there. Therefore, actually for sure, Euler solution can be used to identify some faults, but not the major faults. It can be used to show some small faults. Because residuals are important, I had to develop some residuals. There are so many algorithms that can be used to develop residuals, and none of these res uh, algorithms is better than the other. So this symbol bogey, that's va second vertical derivative that will give us a residual and high pass filter that will give us some residuals. Well, the vertical derivative gives us pockets of depot centers, as you can see. But uh, high pass filter, basically, it gives us just predominantly three depot centers. And it's able to show us that uh, the southernmost depot center, the Pakase, is splitting into two. Uh, also, I did something on upward continuation in comparison to simple bogey and band pass filter. No much difference between the two. Upward continuation uh, highlights some dike. There's a dike there uh, at where Pakase Depot Center is seated. Uh, still, a uh, band pass filter shows us that uh, the southernmost Depot Center, Pakase, further splits into two. So in summary, the Musenge, Olkom Musenge and Olkomata and centers are joining and they separate at some distance, roughly D is equal to uh, three kilometers. The faults within the survey er area, on average, are parallel with respect to Koja Fault. The sediment in the Musenge centers are deeply buried. And there's a, there's a dike in the southernmost uh, depot center that controls the migration of sediments from Lake Magadi. Thank you for that. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Innocent Chimoita. Uh, please, another round of applause. He has, once again, as well, uh, kept us on the brink of the time we estimated. Uh, I hope the next presenter can better that. Uh, and this is Mr. Derek Kimbeni. By the way, uh, I usually like summarizing the takeaways from presentations when I'm, I moderate. Uh, again, that is another rule that is scrapped because of time. Uh, I, hope, I wish there was time because this is my area of specialization. I would have been giving the takeaways. Since I'm not doing that, Derek, make sure what you present are the takeaways. So welcome Derek Mbenyi uh, with interpretation of structural domains beneath Lake Edward George Basin uh, from seismic data. Lake Edward George Basin, as he's going to tell us, is found in southern, southwest Uganda. You're welcome, Derek. Thank you so much, Mr. Clovis. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm going to make a presentation on interpretation of seismic data, uh, seismic structures uh, along. These are interpretation of, of structure domains beneath Lake Edward George Benson, which is in southwestern Uganda from seismic data. And the, the outline of my presentation is as follows the introduction, the methodology, results, and conclusions. Uh, this basin of Lake Edward George Benson is found within the southwestern Uganda. Oh, sorry which is in that point which is highlighted red on the left part and the, this basin occupies most of the part the southern part of the of the Albertine Graben where we have uh, discoveries of air and gas uh, they have made a number of discoveries the kingfisher discoveries uh, the Lenga development project which has the discoveries by total and this basin, which is my study area, is 40 kilometers wide and 70 kilometers long. It contains sediments up to 500 meters of, which is a deep center of the basin. The deep center is, if you have a basin, the maximum thickness of sediments. And we know our oil and gas in Uganda comes from those sediments, from the source rocks. So in this area, exploration has been done by Dominion Uganda Limited between 2000 2000 and 2010, and this area was initially 4B, but we are lucky that this area has an area which is under licensing, because we know that to have sustainable development and production, we need to explore more oil and gas discoveries in Uganda. And also we know that 20% of the grabbing has been, has been explored, so we need to make any mass studies to add on to the discoveries. And the objective of this uh, study was to evaluate the hydrocarbon potential of this basin by determining the structure domains struct and, and structures as well as the structure fireways from seismic data. And the, down are the specific objectives of the study to identify the structures in the study area. And here we are looking at the uh, potential structures of the key elements of the petroleum system, where we have the traps, the source rocks, uh, the migration pathways, the seals. If you have your benson and it's not sealed, which means you end up uh, collecting nothing, so we need to evaluate on these structures. Then to characterize and define the structural domains. And by domains, I mean areas or regions with similar structural properties. So for example, you find an area which, which has a similar folding style, folding style, we look for these areas, then we, we then look for the structural areas in those areas. For example, if you're in this room and the you have this room is full of uh, mangoes and oranges. We look for areas which have uh, mangoes in the same area, and those will be our domains. And then within those, that area which has mangoes, which are the sweetest mangoes. So we evaluate and see which mangoes can give us better juice. So I'm just giving an example, lemon is an example of these fireways. So this is the methodology. We had to import our data, which is the 2D seismic data, and the well data from Ngaji well into the petrol software, which helps you to visualize these uh, interpretations. And because 2D seismic data is in time, and well data is acquired in depth, we have to make a well tie to be able to identify your horizon and, and interpret the results. Then you make the structure analysis and the, stru and the stratigraphic analysis to be able to achieve our objectives. Uh, on the right is one of the seismic sections from our data, and the, we are seeing a number of forests which act as migration pathways for hydrocarbons into our reservoir. And the, we see these total blocks, these are potential fault traps in our basin, as we shall see ahead. Uh, under the domains, we're able to uh, characterize this uh, study area in two domains, the extension structure domains, which is characterized by tensile forces and the planar structures and the compression structure uh, domain, which has been labeled on the left as C. Then uh, the E are the st extension structure domains. Why is this important? Because as we are doing exploration, it is expensive, so we need to understand our area and be able to look for these structures, which will be potential traps, potential migration, migration paths, 
and I'm interested in the traps because we know if you have a reserve and it's just if you have a source which is which is like our kitchen which is generating the hydrocarbons and they are moving via, via these faults and there's no accumulation, then it becomes useless. So our interest are the traps where we can be able to interpret and identify them and drill and drill our hydrocarbons. And the, within this compression structure domains, we have the compression of faults, which are potential traps. And also within the extension structure domains, we have the um, fault seal traps, which are potential traps as well. And still on the left are the prospects and the leads. We have identify some of the prospects which are in red and the leads. These are potential areas which I'm, which I'm indicating there as the traps. And the right is just one of the, uh, the prospects A, showing us the, this trap is good. It has a good closure, and which means it has the potential to accumulate hydrocarbons. So in conclusion, these structural domains are pertinent in structural modeling because structures around the inland basin mimic the structures of the basement because we are looking for these structures the traps. So we, that's our main, our main target. So with this structural domains, you can be able to zero in your area for exploration and, and drill based on that. And these results from this mission uh, give a better understanding of the area in terms of the structures, uh, the structural domains, the prospects, the leads, and the petroleum potential of the basin. We are, we are looking at the potential of these traps accumulating hydrocarbons. Are they seeding? How big are they? So, 3D seismic data we've acquired in this area, in this basin, will provide an excellent opportunity to further understand these prospects and propose areas for, to drill further wells which can add value to the country. And the interpretation of this structural domain is an effective tool in petroleum explora exploration. Thank you. Maybe lastly, I would like to thank uh, Makera University, in particular Dr. Chiveru and Dr. Anyu, for the work. And uh, lastly, I want to thank the Petroleum Authority and uh, the, leadership, the leadership of the Executive Director and my Director, Mr. Clovis Brighty Rumba, for providing me with the data and the necessary support to, to undertake this study, which is going to add value to the oil and gas industry. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Doctor or Mr. Derek. Mr. Derek Mbenyi for showing us the work you have done. And indeed, as you say, it's value addition as far as the understanding of the petroleum potential of Southern Lake Albert Basin is concerned. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this particular session in the conference booklet is on page 77. Uh, you, I request you to get time and read the profiles of these distinguished speakers. They are very educated men. As I said earlier, there is no woman among them. Uh, you know, this is your science. We have Susan here. I thought she was a speaker, but she did not submit a paper to the APC. But she's a geophysicist. So this whole role is, it seems, for geophysicists, apart from you, Derek. Uh, thank you very much, nonetheless, and we are moving quite well, by the way. Uh, read the profiles of these people. They have uh, bachelor's degrees. They have master's degrees. They have worked master's degrees from uh, overseas in reputable institutions. They have worked in their respective uh, oil and gas sectors for a number of years. Uh, it's very, very intriguing to be listening to this caliber of uh, professionals. And once again, I thank you for paying attention and for being here to listen to the work they have done. Uh, last but not least, allow me to invite my brother, Dr. Shaidu Nur Shaban. Uh, Dr. Shaban is going to talk about delta deposits, an implication of the paleohydrologic connectivity of rift lakes Tanganyika and Rukwa, East Africa. Join me in welcoming him to the podium. And uh, allow him to summarize for us the key takeaways from this beautiful composition. Uh, you're welcome, uh, Dr. Shaban. Thank you very much, moderator. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as uh, the moderator said, I will try to summarize my uh, presentation because of time. So, uh, if, okay, great. So, yeah, so I will take you through the, the, 
uh, dirt hike deposit that we see in the Lake, Lake Changanyika, the southern eastern part of Lake Changanyika, uh, nearby uh, the where on the opposite side, I mean on the other side of the of the lake, we have the Lake Rokwa. So uh, we have an we had an hypothesis that the, this is due to uh, the hydrologic connectivity between the two lakes. So uh, the, the aims uh, were at predicting the possible hydrological connection between Lake Sanganik and Rukwa uh, uh, with an hypothesis that Lake Rukwa overflowed into Lake Tanganyika. Then also analyzing the effect of the Rungwa volcanic edifice the, to the regional precipitation distribution, as we're gonna see in the next slide because uh, we hypothesize that the current uh, or the modern environment where we have the underfeed Lake Rukwa probably occurred due to the Rungwe volcanic uh, construction. Also, reconstructing the power environment between Lake Tanganyika and Lake Rukwa and investigate how did this respond to climate change. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, the point uh, doesn't work, but I, I want you to uh, take a look at the map that I'm showing on the right side of the PowerPoint presentation. So uh, beginning from the northern side uh, of the map, uh, not left side, so we have Lake Kivu and we have Lake Tanganyika. Then uh, within the Lake Tanganyika, we see the, uh, the black box or rectangle. And that is where we, we, we have the delta. And you see that uh, according to the Dictor elevation model, you see that you have the low uh, elevation where we have the Ifuma River, which currently is very small. We c probably doesn't even qualify to be called a river. And you see that uh, that low goes to uh, the southern part and connects where we have the modern Lake Rukwa. So that is uh, why we were very eager to know if the data that we see at Karema uh, were uh, due to the overflow of Lake Rukwa and Lake Tanganyika. So we answer several questions. Uh, one of those questions is, did Lake Rukwa overflow into Lake Tanganyika and cause those data? And did the uh, growth of the Rungwa volcanic uh, province create a rain shadow around the Lake Rukwa area? And what is the likely cause of the modern underfeed Lake Rukwa? So to orient you from the map, uh, the Rungwa volcanic is in the southern part uh, of Lake Rukwa. So at the southern tip of Lake Rukwa, you see that we have the high, uh, elevation high, uh, where we have the Rungwa volcanic. So, and these are the deltaic kinoforms that we see from the seismic data set, spectacular, thick and large. Uh, and when we try to hypothesize or building a, an hypothesis, we try to compare the delta that we see around that area with the delta that are associated with the big drainages, like the delta that are associated with the Rosizi River, which is uh, in the northern side uh, of the Lake Tanganyika. Uh, also, uh, the delta that are associated with uh, Mag uh, Malagaras River, which is the main drainage that drains into the lake. And it turns out that when you compare uh, the thickness uh, of these deltas at Karema, they are second to Ruzizi uh, delta, which uh, of course they should be big because we have the Ruzizi River that flows all the way from Lake Kivu uh, to uh, Lake Tanganyika. So when we compare again those deltas with uh, the thickness of delta in Lake Malawi, uh, the Dwanga delta, uh, which is uh, Dwanga River is larger than what I showed you, the Fuma River, we see that the Karema Delta are thicker. And this uh, gives us uh, a clue that pro possibly uh, the Karema Delta were not uh, deposited by the existing uh, uh, Fuma River. So we say that there must be a long-term hydrological connectivity between Lake Tanganyika and Lake Rukwa. And probably what we see under the modern environment, the size of Lake Rukwa, was due to longer volcanic construction that caused a rain, rain shadow and diminishing precipitation around that area. So how to test this hypothesis? We used the modeling approach where we combined or we integrated 
the landscape uh, ev evolution model, the fast scape modeling, with the orographic precipitation model, uh, the linear upslope model. So I will now take you through uh, the, the greater nature of these methods, but it is, uh, I can say that more than 40 questions uh, are contained within uh, this modeling approach. So how did we uh, set up the model? So actually we, ra we ran three models. The first model used the, the existing topography, meaning that we used the existing digital elevation model of the area. And the two models, uh, we generated the artificial uh, elevation, whereby the second and the third model, which were both using the artificial uh, elevation, the first model, uh, that is the second model actually, uh, we included the volcano uh, within the, the model. We generated the, the volcano, the southern part of uh, where we think that that is uh, Lake Rukwa. And the third model, we did not uh, include the volcano. And that is to test uh, the result that we see from the model that is ran with volcano vis-a-vis -vis that is ran without volcano. So in terms of the results, uh, the sum of the results, and that's what you're seeing is the topography. So initially when we said uh, the, the boundaries for, to, for, for, for the faults and for the, uh, the general uh, uh, morphometry of the, of the lakes, uh, the two lakes were about uh, 60 to 50 to 60 kilometers apart. After the model, which were run after five million years, we see that uh, the two lakes, they connect. Okay, and we see that we have uh, higher topography generally uh, from the model that is run with the uh, volcano as compared to the model that was run without uh, volcano. But also, uh, as I said, uh, we were trying to see if uh, the connection uh, happened in time okay, when we had no volcano in the southern part of Lake Tanganyika, of Lake Iroquois. So we tested uh, the precipitation that is generated after five million years. So we compare the two models, the model with volcano and the one without volcano. And you see that the model that has volcano has a pronounced rain shadow around the Kirukwa, probably uh, telling what we see uh, currently that we have underfeed the Kirukwa, meaning that the precipitation that is received within the area of the Kirukwa is minimum as compared to what the precipitation that is received uh, in Lake Tanganyika. And we see that the model that is run without volcano, almost we have the even distribution of precipitation. So uh, I will not go through this, uh, but uh, in general, we were trying to uh, compare the satellite data set from the model uh, results. So in conclusion, uh, we concluded that uh, what we see uh, in the Karema area in terms of the deltas, these were possibly uh, generated or deposited as the overflow of Lake Kirukwa into Lake Tanganyika. So the cartoon, uh, uh, so the, 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 the cartoon in the top of the image shows you the time when we did not have volcano and that the precipitation and Probably the, there was a period that there were uh, much uh, heavy precipitation. And Lake Kirukwa, because of uh, confined uh, accommodation to accommodate the water and the structure uh, linkage between the two lakes uh, through the Karema Depression, the water overflowed into Lake Tanganyika. And uh, the Ifuma River was wide by that time, causing the deltaic deposit around the Karema area. And uh, in the modern environment, as the Rungo volcano later uh, was constructed, uh, created a rain shadow, uh, and the rain uh, was, I mean, the rain became diminished around the area, causing uh, the underfed lake. So the implication in terms uh, of uh, uh, business opportunities, we know that uh, the deltas have been proved to be reservoirs uh, for uh, hydrocarbons. 
And uh, we anticipate that also uh, in this area, if the sediment were sourced from the uh, shoreline of Lake Rukwa, probably there must be cause uh, material. Uh, therefore, the sand uh, reservoir within this delta deposit should be of good quality for uh, forming potential reservoirs. Uh, uh, and also, uh, is a chance for, uh, I mean, it, it opens another opportunity for uh, the interested uh, companies uh, to uh, do more exploration within the area and see if there is uh, the potential of discovering oil, especially oil, within the area. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaban. Uh, thank you for the intriguing research that attempts to answer an intriguing set of questions. And uh, we are thrilled about the manner in which you actually make conclusions regarding the questions asked uh, in the opening section of your presentation. Uh, like I said, I'm not summarizing any takeaways, but in the interest of time, our approach was to have questions subject to my uh, authority uh, at the end of the session. So I would like to request anyone who wrote down a very intriguing question for either of these gentlemen who uh, entertained us with a very beautiful presentations. Yes, please. Uh, how about Chibuka? Uh, start with that gentleman. Uh, you say your name, and then the the person to whom the question is directed. Yeah, um, how about Chibuka? And I would like to ask Dr. Shaidu Nur. Uh, my question is, uh, other than the physical feel of the benzene, is there any evidence in terms of biota uh, having moved from uh, Lake Lukwa to Lake Tanganyika that shows that actually there is a movement? Because in your modeling, it was like physical modeling of sediment movement and not biota. Thank you. Noted the question. Uh, next is uh, Miss Susan, Sister Susan Viona. Uh, thank you, moderator, and thank you to all our presenters. Uh, my question goes to Innocent. Uh, when you're doing depth estimation using the ULA method, you come up with a range of depth solutions, and you require to come up with a solution list. So I would like you to guide us on how to determine the minimum and the maximum depth in your solution list. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, that is it for the questions. I will request Dr. Shaban come to the podium and answer the question. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, question. So to answer the question, uh, the model did not uh, include the aspect of, of biota in terms of uh, species, but uh, there are some uh, current studies that uh, uh, they can incorporate that in, into the model. However, uh, we have some uh, evidences of where I showed you where we have the low uh, elevation uh, from the Lake Rukwa toward Lake Tanganyika, we have evidences of uh, paleolakes. Uh, we see this stramo stramo stramatolites, uh, uh, rocks, but also as well as uh, the bivalves, uh, fossil that uh, uh, lacustrine uh, generated. Uh, I, th I hope that maybe uh, has answered your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that precise answer. Uh, Innocent, Susan uh, has picked interest in the depth profiles, but I didn't see you write down the question. I got it. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Okay, please. 
So basically, Euler solution method is known to have uh, an error of 15%. So the values we have there, they could be more than or less than 15%. Or, uh, there are two values could be less than or more than 15% of those values there. That the range of the Euler, the Euler solution. So it's an estimate value. It doesn't give the exact. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I recognize my younger brother, Henry Tumusima, who is the reporter for this, uh, for this particular session. Uh, join me in giving a very loud clap to this gentleman for the job well done. I request you to stand up and stand here in the order in which your presentations were flowing with the first one standing next to me, and so on and so forth. Uh, you will guide us how this thing goes. Uh, is it picture first, and then uh, those uh, beautiful things? OK. Uh, can you extend a little bit so that there is room for me as well? Thank you very much. The session is declared closed. You can now move to Victoria Ballroom. <laughs>